Hello, this is Haku Dabin, and I'm here with part three of Beasts of the Old Letter. There's a book from the that was mentioned in the, in the SCP 1762, also known as Where the Dragons Went. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Let's get into this. Etar, wait, E R. Oh, like the character from Winnie the Pooh. Ah, crap. Can't really mention that. Anyway, as certified zoologist, it's my job to venture into any and all regions of the fantastic lands to discover new species. One of the most perilous journeys took me to Winnie Cooper Iceland, a flat stretch of snow that is susceptibly deep. There are countless legends of a whole world living below the snowfall. Tells of things such as ice elves and ancient monsters that have been inhabited for centuries. Such legends are an enticing incentive for people such as myself to explore. And although travel parties have never discovered these being spoken of in the fables, we have discovered more than 20 new animal species hidden in the ice. From the shy and plump and plumers that huddle in the hundreds as to conserve body heat, to the snow lances that lie in wait and waiting to spear unfortunate and prey with their icicle tipped horns. And all these travels we relied on the hardness and warmth of the Etor to make sure we wouldn't freeze to death on our journeys. The Eeyore, sorry, I keep on saying their name wrong, I'm not really sure how to say it. The Eeyore are a group of beasts that have been domesticated by the Cooper villagers for decades. Eeyores are incredible. Are incredibly docile, at most grunting softly when annoyed, and perhaps kicking a shower of snow at someone. And so I think the sight of seeing someone bewildered as they are covered from head to toe in snow, oh, amuses a beast. If one does such an act, others nearby will rumble together in a chorus that sounds almost like laughter. Eagles walk on four legs, arranged like a cross, that are, are as thick as tree trunks, with this, with strong flat feet that allow them to walk across the deep snow without sinking. Their heads are small relative to the rest of their bodies, and is reminiscent of a turtle. Large folds of fat that are surprisingly warm line the ER's back and store necessary sustenance for the animal in times when food is scarce. However, the most fascinating parts of the ER are the large, multiple fin-like growths that ring the sides of the fat folds. Made of hollow bone on at the base, these fins are transparent and shine an iridescent white during the short times of sunlight in the Kupri Icelands. In just a few hours of sun, these growths can absorb and retain an astounding amount of heat for the cold nights. Whenever we would camp, the Eeyore or would spread at these growths like a fan. The fins would glow red with the warmth and, the, and calm of a comforting fire. And no matter the frigid temperatures around us, with the Eeyore, we would always sleep peacefully. Jorthwags. Jorthwags have, have been used by the various estimative races of the fantastic lands for transport. Oh, that doesn't sound very okay to say. Anyway, racing and beasts of burden. In at least one of the Evixi societies in the Midlands, a pixie's wealth can be determined by the size and quality of their herd. Even the largest North X that I have seen was small enough to fan my hand. The perfect proportion for most of their masters. Oh, they mean small, like fairies. Okay. In terms of their head and body shape, their appearance is similar to a cross between a horse and an antelope. Out of the head grows a pair of relatively large curled branching antlers. Each North X possesses six legs, very similar to those of a cricket. Which they use for leaping. Dwarf wax come in a variety of vibrant colors, most commonly pinkish red and green, but blue and gold other varieties also exist, though these are more commonly reserved for knights and royalty. One of the historical accounts including Dwarf wax that I, I find most interesting is the Battle of Kor. For several years, a war that had been raging as the Mavish spirits attempted to drive the invading Korish gnomes out of their territories. The wizard clung and it describes a boon by increasing their, their size so they might fight on equal 
building with enormous forces. However, during the change, the sprite's storage box is also increased in size. After overrunning the enormous forces is on the field of battle, the sprites were able to use the newfound snapping trick of their Dorthrax to breach the, the numb secluded mountain and stronghold of Kor, forcing peace and bringing the numbs under their rule. Huh. Karafar Dorsha Arts. Approximately 200 years ago, in the southern dwarven Empire of the North, King Karthik IV commissioned a mass of treasury to be constructed with within Mount, Mount, Mount Karafar in order to house the kingdom's supply of gold. On the southeastern face of the mountain, an enormous door to the treasury was placed in the clay face. This door was enchanted to unrecognize and allow members of the royal court into the, the treasury. Uh, unfortunately, King Karthik and his 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 builder did, had not anticipated the battering rams and catapults of the Lord and Giants. While the craft drawer was shattered, its many fragments retained parts of the enchantment. Each shard took on its own personality and name. The shards are capable of projecting their thoughts into the mind of their holder, usually in the form of images, songs, tales, and conversation. The shards can also communicate with each other as if they if they are in close enough proximity, the two holders which are close together can hold a conversation of thoughts through their shards. Following the breaking of the door, the craft of shards were collected and dispersed throughout the fantastic lands. In many places, they were cut, polished, and sold as exotic jewelries. In other places, the shards were a treasure for their eccentric and curious personalities, and were used by artists as muses of inspiration. I myself created a in a craft for a, a shard companion named Hathod with me on a necklace for several years. The lightning struck Titan. It is a mercy to all the fantastic lands the lightning struck Titan only awakens when the passing of Varro's sort or over three hundred years in the southern dragon mountains of Kor. The beast resembles a beetle or hermit crab with a dragon's head, covered in a galite it's a pyramid of stone and dirt that accumulates over its 300 year er, er slumbers. A huge crumbling spiraling tower resides on its back, built by the same sorcerer when the storm that way it's whom the storm that way it's the beast is named after. Bramroth came to the fantastic lands 2,000 years ago in a search to build a place where he could practice and practice his art of weather spells. The jagged mountains proved ideal to him. And with their isolation and formidable appearance, he, he began to construct a tower at the plateau of the house mountain he could at find. It would take him 15 years to complete. As soon as the final brick was placed, he began to call forth a thunderstorm more powerful than any of the mountains had seen. A lightning surge from the spire of ever of top hours to the basin below, each strike stirring the peace he had built his tower upon. With earth shaking might, the titan stretched his arms in rows. A thousand foot alight that was a bell that the storm and caused pain while at the same time restoring it to life. The lightning struck tides and began to move once more, eating huge trunks of earth and stone from the cliffside as with its toothed maw. All and all the while the storm raged about of its back, Flo following the tide as it lumbered through the jagged mountains. Bramroth himself perished as his tower collapsed with each step the, the, the giant took. A dragon saw it at once to try and stop the beast, or at, least, or at the very least impede it, but a titan was impervious to all magic. It was an ancient, long-forgotten creature, a force of nature, and it seemed its rampage would destroy all of the fantastic lands. Finally, a group of mages led by a sorceress his name Talia arrived. They cast a spell that created the great winds to drive the storm away from the lightning-struck titan, and the beast began to slow as the energy gained from the storm disappeared. It managed to return to its resting place before falling asleep once and again, and the lands that raised fell silent. Talia and her group were held as heroes, and they turned their efforts to restoring the damage done by the titan. Afterwards, they would guard the jagged mountains until their deaths, continuing to strengthen the enchantment that kept <sighs> Bamar of Storm and the lightning struck titan apart. However, the two are bound to meet again. Bram of Storm returns every 300 years from its banishment in the Hallowing Sands to reawaken the beast below. The last time I'm the Titan awoke was 100 
and then 87 years ago. I fear the day we must once again prepare for the worst. I suppose one more can't hurt. Monoliths to heaven. In the flats, I'll use in plains of Zanu, a group of creatures is live in a group that grows by a mere one member at the beginning of each each year. The monoliths to heaven. Each monolith it is less flesh and more stone, made of obsidian. They are shaped like a rugged eclipse with a singular large hole running through the top portion. Like a downward staring eye. Two spinning legs jet out of the faulted ground from the center of the monoliths. Legs that look like they would never be able to support a creature or of the monoliths mass. However, the monolith at deep magical tides with the stars allow them to stand for the long walk they must undertake every new year. Monoliths travel between lo two, lo two locations, two locations only. One is the site of a meteor, a crater that spans a thousand feet wide. The other is tomb for Argyang the Magician, the monolith's creator, known for his near eccentric obsession with the stars. Is that an eye? Yeah, it's an eye. So, Gian frequently entered to the Zanu Plains with stargazing gear, constantly looking for what he claimed to be the heavenly planet. Such a planet is described vaguely in old Zanu texts, but only as a folktale, a legend. However, until his dying breath, Gian believed that the heavenly planet would be no more than and just submit, and so created monoliths to carry out his work when he himself could no longer achieve his dream. Until the week before the new year, the monoliths remained buried in a ring around and getting stormed. During the time, the time the holes in their body create various patterns as the sun rises and sets. Once Eve falls out on the week before the new year, the monoliths rise from their slumber one by one, and it's, it's during this time they can. One can see the young's determination to ascend to the heavenly planet. The, third car the tallest current monolith tower is a staggering 600 feet in the air. Each following monolith is 50 feet shorter for a total of a dozen. As the sky darkens, the monoliths begin a slow 50 mile walk to the crater site, with only the starlight to guide them. As they walk in descending order, they almost look like, a like the stairs of a giant's castle. On the dawn of the new year, when they have gathered in the center of the crater, the birth of a new monolith begins. Still under the ascending order, where the light of the new sun shines through the holes of the monoliths to the ground, eliminating the possible out where a new member will rise from the ground, born from the fragments of the meteor that struck the fantastical lands 2,000 years ago. This new member will become the new tallest monolith, the next stepping stone to Gang's favorable world. Once the monolith takes its place at the front of the line, the sun giants begin to walk back to the grave of their master, but they bury themselves once again until the next year. And I think that's enough. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. This was about 13 and a half minutes. And I'll be back with more tomorrow. Goodbye.